My question for you this morning is, who here thinks that Armenia can be a real global leader in innovating solutions for the world's big development challenges? I want to tell you a, a story. So this is how the story goes. I call it the bony fish story. There, there was a, a, a poor village living alongside a lake in Africa many years ago. And this village, the villagers, um, they, they absolutely survived, counted on this lake for, for their food and for their economy. They, 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 fish was an important part of, of their diet, and, and any surplus fish that they had, they, they ended up selling on to, to boost their economy and cr create income. So, in, but they were still very poor. So an international NGO came by, had this great idea, let's, let's make their lives better by giving them a better fish, uh, uh, you know, a fish that, that is more delicious and can reproduce itself better. And so, so they went ahead with this project and they introduced this fish, this new fish into, into their lake. And at first, everything seemed to be going really well. The, the fish reproduced, proliferating across the lake, lots of fish. But then something unexpected happened. What happened was that this fish that they introduced started devouring all the other fish that still remained in that lake, and in fact started destroying the entire ecosystem of the lake. Then the next unexpected thing, the fish proved to be so bony that none of the villagers wanted to eat it, and they couldn't sell it. So here was this seemingly great idea but with really bad results. And in some versions of this story, again, it's more like an urban legend, some versions of the story, it gets even worse or better depending on your um, sense of humor, but that the project was deemed so successful that it was then replicated in another country in another part of the world. But before I explain to you why we should reject these stereotypes, or at least start to reject some of these stereotypes of these big international organizations and, and develop more, more, more generally. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about how, how I arrived here. I grew up, as Mimi mentioned, in, in California, and as a young kid, I was always really idealistic. Um, I wanted to do my part in, in helping change the world, and I saw around me, even in my community, um, so much inequality, and I wanted to do something about it. When I had the chance to travel a bit in the developing world, I, I saw more of this inequality, and it struck me even in deeper. And so when I entered university, it was right in the beginning of the, the internet revolution, the dot-com boom, and where everyone thought that anything and everything was, was possible, and the internet was connecting people up in, in new and exciting ways, and, and a lot of my classmates at, at university seem to be just focused on sort of using the internet as a way to their first million dollars, or in some actual cases, um, their first billion dollars. Meanwhile, I was still very idealistic, and I was studying philosophy. I was thinking about questions like how to reconcile liberty with equality and things like that. Not really very financially oriented. And before I knew it, I, I made my way, I, I found myself studying for my PhD in New York City, and still very idealistic, and with these ideals, I was driven towards the, 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 the ideals, too, of the United Nations, and I kept trying and trying to, to land a job at the UN, and, and finally, um, after a lot of tries, a lot of attempts, found myself on an airplane, to Zagreb, where I was, right, found myself right in the middle of um, the conflict in former Yugoslavia. And I was now officially a minted human, humanitarian aid worker. And it, it was exhilarating, thrilling in a way, and I really saw the potential of the international development system, but I also saw really its, its sobering limits. In early 1995, I was sent out to, to a mission to assess the situation 
in a village in, in eastern Bosnia. This, this village was one of these so-called, at that time, UN safe havens. Um, it was meant to be safe from all the war, all the violence around it. And as such, thousands of people have crammed into this small town, which was basically blockaded, right? They had very little access to, to anything, and, and that's why I was going there to see, to see what the conditions of people were and how we could help. And, and when, I, when I arrived, I, you know, the, the place was just cramped, packed full of people, um, lining the roads and along the valley, and, and old people, young people, people who clearly had not had a lot of food to, to eat, or very, probably very little food to eat in, 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 in days and weeks before, and were barely surviving. I left this place, and not long after I visited this place, virtually all of the people, all the thousands of people that I saw would be killed. And they, they were killed in what was known as, what became known as the Srebrenica Massacre. I became very depressed, disillusioned. I left the United Nations. Um, I went back to San Francisco. I went back to Silicon Valley. I started work in a small startup founded by some of my classmates at, at university. Um, it's a management consulting company focused, of course, on the IT sector there in Silicon Valley. But all the time, I was thinking about how I could apply these business principles that I'm learning, these new IT technologies that I'm learning to the development sector, to making the world a better place, not just making money. And so, after just a short while back in the private sector, frankly, I made that fateful decision, went back to the UN, and had the privilege to serve in, in many different missions in, in Kosovo, in Iraq, in Indonesia. And I, I began to realize that like there was an, an Internet 2.0 revolution, what, and that sort of signified a, a new, more collaborative network use of, of the Internet, I, I realized too that, there, that we were re really in the middle of what I describe or, as development 2.0, a new way of do, doing development work, sort of the anti bony fish way of doing development work. So in, in, this, in this way, in this new approach, instead of these big bureaucracies top down where people say in these capitals of Geneva, New York, Washington, Rome, are, are identifying what the problems are and identifying the solutions are and, and applying these sort of remote control solutions in a way to, to, to people's lives. Rather, what we mean by development 2.0 is that it, it turns that whole dynamic around. It's a much more grassroots approach. It's a much more citizen-driven approach where the citizen herself at the very local level is really driving the identify, identification of the problem and driving how to solve that problem and then finally implement the solution to that problem. And I'll show you a bit what I mean. So this is, this is Iceland. It's known for, I guess it's known for its shaggy horses and its erupting volcanoes that sometimes disrupt global air traffic, but it's also become known recently for something really amazing. Just a short while ago, the population of this country decided it wanted to crowdsource a new constitution. Think about that for a minute. That's pretty amazing, right? And how they did it, how, how did they go about it? They, they basically, 950 people were randomly selected from their national registry. So people from all walks of life, like students, artists, unemployed, janitors, professors, businessmen, whatever, were, were invited to, to tell what their priorities, their values, their ideas were for a new constitution. And then, then an equally sort of random group, ra randomly selected group, drafted um, a, a new constitution, and then at the end, that's where the technology comes in. At the end, this draft circulation, this, sorry, this draft constitution was 
was opened up for everyone in the whole, entire country to comment on, provide feedback on via Facebook. Now ultimately, the, the, the Constitution hasn't yet become law, but for me, that's almost besides the point. For me, it's all about how the citizenry have completely transformed their relationship with government. It's a profound shift that, is, that must have happened, right? And it, things won't change, and things won't regress, I don't think. It's a whole new participatory process. Now, here's a, here's a story from the developing world. This is Kashmir. Um, over the past few weeks, Kashmir has been hammered by, by terrible flooding. It's killed hundreds, thousands of people. Um, it's displaced tens of thousands more. And this is a story, first of all, in a technological sense of, of using data in a new, more distributed, networked way. And what happened here was that many of the people that were affected by the floods still were somehow connected. They were connected via their smartphones and they were making cr cries for help, pleas for help, through Twitter, through Facebook, through WhatsApp messages. But the interesting thing here is, again, how, how the kind of social dynamic changed. What happened is that the government, in this case of, of all of all institutions, the, the army quickly realized what was going on and decided to set up dedicated Facebook page, dedicated Twitter feeds, dedicated WhatsApp channels to help coordinate the information coming in. And it's estimated that through this new use of social media that 12,000 people were saved just through social media alone in, 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 this, in this emergency. But, but for me, what's more interesting is, is the social dynamic that's happening here and the social shifts and the new relationship between citizens and, and the government. Now here, here's a story much, much closer to home. This is Anna. She was working um, in the... Uh, Yerevan Hematology Center, or the Yerevan Blood Center. And you can imagine that in, in developing countries, um, managing blood supplies, national blood supplies, is notoriously difficult. It's more often than not paper-based, which leads to a lot of inefficiency, a lot of transparency, non-transparency, the potential for corruption. And Anna was frustrated because she knew that there was a problem, but, and, and she also knew what the solution was. The solution was to digitize this blood supply. And you, can imagine, you can imagine if you had a loved one, a son or a daughter, a brother or sister, who, who had an accident, needed blood, but you, know, you couldn't get the blood to, to her at the right time because just of the inefficiencies of the system. You knew the blood was even there, the blood was there around you someplace, but we just couldn't get to it. And so she was really frustrated. Knew what she had to do, but nobody was listening. So this is where we came in, the UN. The UNDP, we ran a, a, an, what we call an innovation camp where we matched people like Anna with, for example, well, well, with other people with the right skill sets to solve the problem. And in this case, we matched Anna up with an IT expert, a young techie, like set, literally a 17-year-old hacker, who helped drive, helped create a digitized a prototype for a digital uh, blood supply you know, they worked together over a period of a few weeks and, and came up with a prototype. It was an absolutely amazing thing. And now, the next step is that this prototype is being tested in three different locations across the country. And the next step after that is to make sure that we link up with policymakers to then implement this 
solution across the country, and we're hopeful that it will be. So what's going on here in all of these, in all of these stories that I've told about Development 2.0 and Armenia being at the leadership of this? Okay, the first, the first bit is about citizen engagement really being driven by new technology. That's one. But another really important development is about how we've turned the whole dynamic on its head. It, this, this before, we used, in the development sector, we talked about beneficiaries. And, and you could even, even in the word, it's, it's, it's passive, right? It's some, somebody who benefits from something, right? It, a person with no agency. You know, power dynamic is just, even in the word, it's top down, right? But we've turned that around and we, we're turning beneficiaries into citizen experts. And this is an important point. And, and this is really happening here, uh, right here in Armenia. And I think a third thing is that I view our job, the job of development workers, the job of big organizations, international NGOs, big international organizations, as, as not, the, not, our job is not to identify problems and identify solutions, but rather there's a sort of matchmaker role where we're matching up, you know, people who are matching up the problem with people who can come up with solution and then with the policy maker to then help roll out that solution, scale up, scale up that solution. And I want to leave you with, um, with one thought. So recently, Armenia was cited as the innovation hub in the entire region in a report by the World Bank. It's really cool. So, so, so the small country of Armenia becoming a virtual giant in the field of technology, right? But, but my dream, my aspiration is for Armenia to become a virtual giant in driving development solutions around the world. Thank you very much.